the rules. As moderator, I will attempt to guide the discussion, asking questions and follow-ups. Joining me in the questioning this evening will be Washington Times reporter Stephen Dynan, CNN chief political correspondent Dana Bash, and Salem Radio's Hugh Hewitt. Candidates, you will have one minute and 15 seconds to answer each question and 45 seconds to respond to follow-ups or for rebuttals if your name is invoked. That's longer than you've had in previous debates. Timing lights will be visible. Those lights will warn you when time is up. And as you, you requested, a bell will also sound like this. We know that each of you wants to debate these important issues, but please wait until you are called upon and please do not talk over one another. These are the rules to which all of you agreed. Our goal this evening is a serious debate on the issues. It's time now for opening statements. You'll each have 30 seconds. Governor Kasich, we will start with you. Well, thank you. You know, I look in the faces of people all across this country, and, and I know they want to be hopeful, and many are hopeful. Look, I can take conservative policies to the White House, to Washington, to restore the strength of our economy, but I also want to transfer power, money, and influence to where you live, because I believe the strength in this country rests in the neighborhoods, the families, the communities, and our states. And I believe it's a new partnership, a partnership that can allow us to restore the spirit of America and strengthen America for the best century we've ever had. Thank you. Senator Rubio, every election is important. I believe this is the most important in a, election in a generation. Because what's at stake in this election is not simply what party is going to be in charge or which candidate wins. What's at stake is our identity as a nation and as a people. For over two centuries, America has been an exceptional nation. And now the time has come for this generation to do what it must do to keep it that way. If we make the right choice in this election, our children are going to be the freest and most prosperous Americans that have ever lived. And the 21st century is going to be a new American century. Senator Cruz. 59 years ago, Florida welcomed my father to America. As he stepped off the ferry boat from Cuba onto Key West, he was 18, he was filled with hopes and dreams, and yet he was in the freest land on the face of the earth. This election, this debate is not about insults, it's not about attacks, it's not about any of the individuals on this stage. This election is about you and your children. It's about the freedom America has always had and making sure that that freedom is there for the next generation, that we stop Washington from standing in the way of the hardworking taxpayers of America. Mr. Trump. One of the biggest political events anywhere in the world is happening right now with the Republican Party. Millions and millions of people are going out to the polls and they're voting. They're voting out of enthusiasm. They're voting out of love. Some of these people, frankly, have never voted before. 50 years old, 60 years old, 70 years old, never voted before. We're taking people from the Democrat Party, we're taking people as independents, and they're all coming out, and the whole world is talking about it. It's very exciting. I think, frankly, the Republican establishment, or whatever you want to call it, should embrace what's happening. We're having millions of extra people join. We are going to beat the Democrats. We are going to beat Hillary or whoever it may be, and we're going to beat them soundly. Thank you. Thank you. Let's begin with jobs in the economy, which Republican voters say is the most important issue to them in this election. There have been some real differences expressed in, on this stage on whether trade deals have been good for the American worker. One of Mr. Trump, the frontrunner's signature issues, is ending what he calls disastrous trade deals in order to bring jobs back to America. Governor Kasich, I'd like to start with you. You've been a strong advocate for these trade deals over the years. Critics say these deals are great for corporate America's bottom line, but have cost the U.S. at least one million jobs. How do you respond to the criticism that you've been catering to boardrooms at the expense of the American middle class? Well, Jake, I, I grew up in a blue-collar family, and uh, the simple fact of the matter is that, of course, we're sensitive about trade. One out of five Americans work in a, a job connected to trade. 38 million Americans are connected to it. But my position has always been we want to have free trade, but fair trade. 
And I've been arguing all along that it is absolutely critical that when other countries break those agreements, we don't turn the process over to some international bureaucrat who comes back a couple, couple years later and says, oh, America was right and people were out of work. The fact of the matter is we have to have an expedited process. When people cheat, when countries cheat and they take advantage of us, we need to blow the whistle. And as President of the United States, I absolutely will blow the whistle and begin to stand up for the American worker. But we don't want to sh lock the doors and pull down the blinds and leave the world because, frankly, if we do that, prices will go up, people will buy less, other people will be out of work, and we don't want to see that happen. Trade, though, has to be balanced, and we have to make sure that when we see a violation, like some country that dumping their products into this country, believe me, as president, I will stand up and I will shut down those imports because they are a violation of the agreement we have, and the American worker expects us to stand up. And Jake, my family worked in the steel industry, not with a white collar. I understand their plight. Mr. Trump, your critics say your campaign platform is inconsistent with how you run your businesses, noting that you've brought in foreign workers instead of hiring Americans, and your companies manufacture clothing in China and Mexico. Why should voters trust that you will run the country differently from how you run your businesses? Because nobody knows the system better than me. I know the H-1B, I know the H-2B. Nobody knows it better than me. I'm a businessman. These are laws, these are regulations, these are rules. We're allowed to do it. And frankly, because of the devaluations that other countries, their monetary devaluations that other countries are constantly doing and brilliantly doing against us, it's very, very hard for our companies in this country, in our country, to compete. So I will take advantage of it. They're the laws, but I'm the one that knows how to change it. Nobody else on this dais knows how to change it like I do, believe me. Senator Rubio, last October you said that you're, quote, generally very much in favor of free trade. More recently, you've backed away from your support of some trade deals. If elected, will you support free trade deals even if it means the inevitable loss of U.S. jobs? No, I support free trade deals that are good for America. We're 5% of the world's population. If all we do is sell things to each other, we can only sell to 5% of the people on Earth. We have to have access to the hundreds of millions of people in the world today who can afford to buy things. The problem is we are a low-tariff country. To import something into the United States is not very expensive. But many of these countries we can't export to because their tariffs are too high. And so I'm in favor of deals that allow us to bring down those tariffs so that America can sell things to all these people around the world. There are good trade deals and there are bad ones. So for example, here in Florida, we have benefited greatly from the free trade deal with Colombia. It's allowed flour exporters to come into the United States, but it's created jobs for millions of, for hundreds of people who are now delivering those flowers and working in that industry. We have a surplus with Colombia. On the other hand, you've seen trade deals like in Mexico that have been less than promising in some aspects, better in others. Bottom line, I, I believe that America, if given access to foreign markets, our workers are the most productive in the world, our people are the most innovative on this planet. If it is a free and fair trade deal, we can compete against anyone in the world, and we need to in the 21st century. Senator Cruz, you were a supporter of the Pacific trade deal, but after taking some heat from conservatives, you changed your position. Why should these voters who don't like these trade deals trust that you will fight for them all the time and not just in election years? Uh, actually, that's incorrect. There are two different agreements. There's TPA and TPP. I, I oppose TPP and have always opposed TPP, which is what you asked about. And when it comes to trade, look, free trade, when we open up foreign markets, helps Americans, but we're getting killed in international trade right now. And we're getting killed because we have an administration that doesn't look out for American workers and jobs are going overseas. We're driving jobs overseas. And, and the people who are losing out are in manufacturing jobs or the steel industry or the auto industry. But I'll tell you who else is going to be losing out, which is the service industry. This Obama administration is negotiating the Trade and Services Agreement, which is another treaty to allow services to come in and take jobs from Americans as, as well. And you've got to understand, trade and immigration are interwoven, and they're hurting the working men and women of this country. So the question is, what's the solution? 
It's easy to talk about the problems, but do you have a solution to fix it? And I think the solution is several things. Number one, we need to negotiate trade deals protecting American workers first, not the corporate boardroom. Number two, we need to lift the regulations on American businesses here so we see jobs coming back. And number three, we need a tax plan like the tax plan I've introduced that will not tax exports and that will tax imports, and that will bring millions of high-paying jobs back to America. Let's talk more about how American jobs are impacted by foreign workers. Let's go to Stephen Dynan of the Washington Times. Stephen. Senator Rubio, in late 2014, Disney laid off 250 tech workers in Orlando, replacing many of them with foreign workers. Some of the Americans even had to train their own replacements. You support increasing the H-1B visa program that made it possible to bring in these foreign workers. Doesn't this program take jobs away from Americans? If it's being abused the way Disney did. Understand that program, it is illegal now under that program to use it to replace American workers. Under that program, you have to prove not only that you're not replacing Americans, but that you've tried to hire Americans. And if a company is caught abusing that process, they should never be allowed to use it again. The second problem with the current structure of the program that people perhaps don't understand is a lot of these companies are not directly hiring employees from abroad. They are hiring a consulting company like Tata, for example, out of India. In, that company then hoards up all of these visas. They hire workers. You hire the Disney or some other company hires this company. What they're basically doing is they are out insourcing and outsourcing <coughs> system. They are bringing in workers from abroad that are not direct employees of a Disney or someone else. They're employees of this consulting business. And what I argue is that no consulting business such as that should be allowed to hoard up all of these visas, that the visa should only be available for companies to use directly to hire workers, and that we should be stricter in how we enforce it. It is illegal now. It is a violation of the law now to use that program to replace Americans. And if a company is caught doing that, whether it be Disney or anyone else, they should be barred from using the program in the future. Senator Rubio, real quick follow-up on this. You've, in, the, in, the concept, in the context of illegal immigration, you've called for uh, basically putting off any legalization process until we get the border secured. Correct. Why not call for a pause on H-1Bs until those abuses you're talked, you've talked about are solved? Well, I, I, first, I think I, well, I'd be open to it if it takes a pause, but I don't think it takes a pause to enforce the actual law. What they're doing is, if they are in fact using that program to replace an American, if there's an American working at Disney, and they bring someone from another country and using H-1B to replace their direct job, that is in violation of the law. And what I'm explaining to you is, what they're doing now is, they're not, what they're doing is they're eliminating the job, they're outsourcing the entire tech division to a consulting company, they're making the argument that we didn't replace you, we just replaced the whole unit by hiring a company to do it instead, and that company that they're hiring is bringing, bringing their workers from abroad. It is a loophole they have figured out that we need to close so they can no longer continue to do it that way. Uh, Governor Kasich, I want to come to you next. Uh, Mr. Trump says that legal immigration is producing, quote, lower wages and higher unemployment for U.S. workers. He's calling for a, a pause on green cards issued to foreign workers. Wouldn't that help workers in the U.S.? Well, look, I, I believe in immigration, but it you know, has to be controlled. Uh, the simple fact of the matter is I wouldn't be standing here. I'd be, you know, maybe running for president of Croatia if we didn't have Im immigration. Immigration is something that brings youth and, and vibrance and energy to our country. But we clearly have to control our borders. We can't have people just walking in. Look, we lock our doors at night in our homes, and the country has to be able to lock its doors as well. So we, uh, I have a comprehensive plan to deal with this problem of immigration. I would say we have to absolutely finish the wall and, and guard the border. And if anybody were to come in after that, they're going to have to go back. No excuses, because we can't continue this problem. I think we ought to have a guest worker program where people come in, work, and go home. And I think at the same time, for the 11 and a half million who are here, then in my view, if they have not committed a crime since they've, since they've been here, they get a path to legalization, not to citizenship. I believe that that program can pass the Congress in the first 100 days. But let's not lose sight of the fact that the whole key to the future of America is strong economic growth with common sense regulation, lower taxes, and a balanced budget. We can have a rising tide that lifts all the workers in America, all the people who are citizens of America, if we'll just follow the formula that works that I used in Washington. And guess what? I've used in Ohio to grow over 400 private sector jobs since I've been governor. 
Uh, Mr. Trump, I do want to come to you. Will you also, in your answer, address how long you think that pause would be and what that pause would look like? How uh, well, would first be? of all, I think, and I know the H-1B very well, and it's uh, something that I frankly use, and I shouldn't be allowed to use. We shouldn't have it. Very, very bad for workers. And second of all, I think it's very important to say, well, I'm a businessman, and I have to do what I have to do, and it's sitting there waiting for you, but it's very bad. <laughs> It's very bad for business in, in terms of, uh, it's very bad for our workers, and it's unfair for our workers, and we should end it. Very importantly, the Disney workers endorsed me, as you probably read, and I got a full endorsement because they're the ones that said, and they had a news conference, and they said he's the only one that's going to be able to fix it, because it is a mess. I think for a period of a year to two years, we have to look back and we have to see, just to answer the second part of your question, where we are, where we stand, what's going on. We have to sort of take a strong, good, hard look and come up with plans that work. And we're rushing into things and we're, we're just, we're leading with the chin. We're leading with people that don't know what they're doing in terms of our leadership. I would say a minimum of one year, maybe two years. Thank you, Mr. Trump. Senator Cruz, I want to bring you in very quickly on this. The United States averages about a million new permanent legal immigrants a year and hundreds of thousands more guest workers. Right. What should the right level be? Well, we need to redefine our legal immigration system so that it meets the needs of the American economy. Right now, we're bringing in far too many low-skilled workers. What that is doing is driving down the wages of, of hard-working Americans. Our system isn't working, and then on top of that, we've got a system that is allowing in millions of people to be here illegally. And the answer to that, I've laid out a very, very detailed immigration plan on my website. We're going to build a wall, triple the border patrol, we're going to end sanctuary cities, and let me tell you how we're going to do that. We're going to cut off federal taxpayer funds to any city that defies federal immigration law. We're going to end welfare benefits for anyone who is here illegally. And, and the thing to understand, Stephen, we can solve these problems. It's not that we don't know how to do it. It's that we're lacking the political will. Neither of the parties in Washington wants to do this. The Democrats support illegal immigration because they view those illegal immigrants as potential voters and far too many of the Republicans are doing the bidding of Wall Street and the special interest and they view it as cheap labor. We need instead leadership that works for the working men and women of this country. We need an immigration system that takes care of the jobs of the working men and women of this country. Senator Rubio, did you want to weigh in? Well, I would just, I would add when you talk about the millions of green cards that are coming in, those are actually workers at all. They're just coming in primarily based on family connection. And let me tell you, my time my parents came in 1956, I acknowledge that my parents came to the U.S. on a family-based system. The problem is nothing looks like it did 60 years ago. The 21st century economy simply is not creating enough jobs for people that don't have skills. When my parents came, they had a very limited education. My father stopped going to school when he was nine years old because his mother died and he had to work and he would work the next 70 years of his life and never go back to school. And I'm grateful every day that America welcomed them. But today, in the 21st century, 60 years later, finding jobs when you don't have skills is very difficult. We need to move to a merit-based system of immigration, not just on H-1B, particularly on green cards. The primary criteria for bringing someone from abroad in the 21st century should be what skills do you have, what business are you going to open, what investment are you going to make, or what job are you going to be able to do when you arrive in the United States? Education obviously plays a large role when it comes to jobs in the economy. The United States has long been falling behind others in the industrialized world. American students currently rank 27th out of 34 countries in math and 17th in reading. Mr. Trump, you've called the education standards known as Common Core a disaster. What are your specific objections to Common Core? Education through Washington, D.C. I don't want that. I want local education. I want the parents, and I want all of the teachers, and I want everybody to get together around a school and to make education great. And it was very interesting. I was with Dr. Ben Carson today, who's endorsing me, by the way, tomorrow morning. And he was... We were talking, we spoke for over an hour in education, and he has such a great handle on it. He wants competitive schools. He wants a lot of different things that, that are terrific, including charter schools, by the way, that the unions are fighting like crazy, but charter schools work, and they work very well. So there are a lot of things, but I'm going to have Ben very much involved with education, something that really is uh, an expertise of his. Okay, but just to clarify, the Common Core standards were developed by the states. Right. States and localities voluntarily adopt them, 
and they come up with their own curricula to meet those standards. So when you say education by Washington, D.C., what do you You're mean? You're right, Jake, but it's been taken over by the federal government. It was originally supposed to be that way, and it certainly sounds better that way, but it's all been taken over now by the bureaucrats in Washington, and they are not interested in what's happening in Miami or in Florida in many cases. Now, in some cases, they would be. But in many cases, they're more interested in their paycheck and the big bureaucracy than they are taking care of the children. Governor Kasich, you have called opposition to Common Core hysteria. What is your response to grassroots conservatives who do not agree with you? Well, look, all I'm in favor of in Ohio is high standards. First of all, let me tell you, I would take 125 federal education programs, put them in four buckets, and send them back to the states. Okay, I've been working on this for many, many years. Secondly, Jake, in our, in our state, the uh, state school board sets the standards, and we want high standards, because we've not always had high standards, unfortunately. They set the standards, and the local school boards de develop the curriculum. Not only did we have that in the law, we reasserted it in the law, and we also want parental advisors in the local school district so that, in fact, uh, you know, frankly, education has to be run at the school board level with a little guidance from, from the state. Now, on top of that, you want to talk about the 21st century and what we need to do with our kids? We need to start connecting them to the real world. We need to be training them for the jobs of the 21st century, not the jobs of 20 years ago. We need vocational education starting in the seventh grade, where kids can get that kind of education that can take them to college, but all the way through their K through 12. They ought to be connected with the real, with real world jobs. Frankly, what ought to happen is we ought to get them to pursue their God-given talents and connect them with the things that give them passion. And that's exactly what we're doing in Ohio, combined with mentoring programs to talk to kids about what their future can be. So let me be clear. Local control, obviously, high state standards, that's what it is in the state of Ohio. So Senator Cruz, let me bring you in. You object to Common Core. Governor Kasich says it's local school boards developing local curriculum to meet higher standards. What's wrong with that? Common Core is a disaster, and if I am elected president in the first days as president, I will direct the Department of Education that Common Core ends that day. Now, let me tell you why you can do that, because it's easy to talk about the problem, but you have to understand the solutions. The Obama administration has abused executive power in forcing Common Core on the states. It has used race to the top funds to effectively blackmail and force the states to adopt Common Core. Now, now, the one silver lining of Obama abusing executive power is that everything done with executive power can be undone with executive power, and I intend to do that. Beyond that, though, Jake, I intend to work to abolish the Federal Department of Education and send education back to the states and back to the local governments. And let me say finally, the most important reform we can do in education after getting the federal government out of it is expand school choice, expand charter schools and home schools and private schools and vouchers and scholarships and give every child, African American, Hispanic, every child in need an opportunity to access to a quality education. Let's move on to another topic of particular interest here in Florida. Florida has the highest percentage of seniors in the country. There are 3.1 million senior citizens here who receive Social Security benefits, and they're very interested in hearing what you candidates intend to do to keep Social Security going for future generations. Let me turn now to my colleague, Dana Bash. Senator Rubio, you argue Americans your age must have an honest conversation about making Social Security sustainable. For people under 55, you want to raise the retirement age and also reduce benefits for wealthier Americans. So what should the new retirement age be and how much will those benefits be cut? Well, first of all, let me say that uh, you're right. There are about 3 million seniors in, the United in Florida with uh, Social Security and Medicare. One of them is my mother, who happens to be here today. I'm against any changes to Social Security that are bad for my mother. And we don't have to make any changes for them. But anyone who tells you that Social Security can stay the way it is, is lying. Any politician that goes around saying, we don't have to do anything, all we have to do is raise a few taxes or just leave it the way it is, they're not being honest with you. Social Security will go bankrupt, and it will bankrupt country with it. So what it will require is people younger, like myself, people that are 30 years away from retirement, to, make, to accept that our Social Security is going to work differently than it did for my parents. For example, Instead of retiring at 67, the way I'm supposed to retire, I'd have to retire at 68. If I were still in the Senate, I'd be one of the youngest people there. Uh, if I've made a lot of money, my Social Security benefit will not grow as fast as someone who made less money. 
And by the way, Medicare could very well become the option of using my Medicare benefit to buy a private plan that I like better. Medicare Advantage does that now. These are not unreasonable changes to ask of someone like myself, who is 25 or 30 years away from retirement, in exchange for leaving the program undisturbed for the people that are on it now or about to retire, and ensuring that we do not bankrupt our country and that this program still exists when my children retire, when my grandchildren retire, when I retire. Senator, the question was specific, though. You've made your plan very clear about generally what you want to do, but how high would the retirement age well, go and how much would you cut those right, benefits? I'm sorry I didn't answer that part. So the thing is that under my, my generation, someone my age would retire at 68. We would continue to allow it to increase the retirement age for future generations until it hits 70. And so my children would retire at 70. I would retire at 68. It would be a graduating scale over a period of time. But again, I'm talking about people like myself and Ted, who are 45 years old, we're years away from retirement. For people that are on it now, we don't have to change it at all. If we don't do anything, we will have a debt crisis. It's not a question of if, it is a question of when. In less than five years, only 17% of our budget will remain discretionary. 83% of the federal budget in less than five years will all be spent on Medicare, Medicaid, the interest on the debt. That's it, all of it will be eaten up by that. That's a debt crisis, and, the, and it will be debilitating to our economy, and our children deserve better than to inherit a debt crisis. Mr. Trump, you don't want to raise the retirement age, and you also don't want to cut benefits even for wealthier Americans. But according to the Social Security Administration, unless adjustments are made, Social Security is projected to run out of money within 20 years. So specifically, what would you do to stop that from happening. Well, first of all, I want you to understand that the Democrats, and I've watched them very intensely, even though it's a very, very boring thing to watch, <laughs> that the Democrats are doing nothing with Social Security. They're leaving it the way it is. In fact, they want to increase it. They want to actually give more. And that's what we're up against. And whether we like it or not, that is what we're up against. I will do everything within my power not to touch Social Security, to leave it the way it is, to make this country rich again, to bring back our jobs, to get rid of deficits, to get rid of waste, fraud, and abuse, which is rampant in this country, rampant, totally rampant. And it's my absolute intention to leave Social Security the way it is, not increase the age, and to leave it as is. Uh, you have 22 years. You have a long time to go. It's not long in terms of what we're talking about, but it's still a long time to go. And I want to leave Social Security as is. I want to make our country rich again so we can afford it. I want to bring back our jobs. I want to do things that will make us, that will bring back GDP. I mean, as an example, GDP was zero, essentially, for the last two quarters. If that ever happened in China, you would have had a, a depression like nobody's ever seen before. They go down to 7 percent, 8 percent, and it's a, it's a national tragedy. We're at zero. We're not doing anything. We've lost our jobs. We've lost everything. We're losing everything. Our jobs are gone. Our businesses are being taken out of the country. I want to make America great again, and I want to leave Social Security as is. We're going to get rid of waste, fraud, abuse, okay. and bring back business. <laughs> Hang on one second. I just want to follow up uh, with Mr. Trump. Uh, you're talking about waste, fraud, and abuse, but an independent bipartisan organization, the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, says improper payments, like you're talking about, that would only save about $3 billion. But it would take $150 billion to make Social Security well, solvent. So how would you find so that under $147 billion? Because they don't cover most of the subjects. We're the policemen of the world. We take care of the entire world. We're going to have a stronger military, much stronger. Our military is depleted. But we take care of Germany. We take care of Saudi Arabia. We take care of Japan. We take care of South Korea. We ta every time this maniac from North Korea does anything, we immediately send our ships. We get virtually nothing. We have 28,000 soldiers on the line, on the border between North and South Korea. We have so many places. Saudi Arabia was making a billion dollars a day. And we were getting virtually nothing to protect them. We, we are going to be in a different world. We're going to negotiate real deals now, and we're going to bring the wealth back to our country. We owe $19 trillion. We're going to bring wealth back to our country. Senator Rubio, yeah. will that be enough to save Social Security? No, and, I, and I think you've outlined why. The numbers don't add up. You know, when I ran for the Senate in 2010, I, w I came out one day and said, we're going to have to make changes to Social Security. And everyone said, that's the end of your campaign. In Florida, you can't talk about that. But people know that it's the truth here in Florida. Fraud is not enough. Uh, certainly, I'm a, well, let's wipe out the fraud. But as you said, it won't add up. You already gave those numbers. The second point is on foreign aid. I hear that all the time as well. I'm against any sort of wasting of money on foreign aid. But it's less than 1% of our federal budget. 
the numbers don't add up. The bottom line is we can't just continue to tiptoe around this and throw out things like I'm going to get a fraud, fraud and abuse. Let's get rid of fraud. Let's get rid of abuse. Let's be more careful about how we spend foreign aid. But you still have hundreds of billions of dollars of deficit that you're going to have to make up. And here's the thing. If we do not do it, we will have a debt crisis, not to mention a crisis in Social Security and Medicare. Both parties have taken far too long to deal with it. It is one of the major issues confronting America. It's barely been asked in any of these debates. And we better deal with it or we're going to have to explain to our children why they inherited this disaster. Mr. Trump, Senator Rubio says your numbers don't add up. What's your response? Senator Rubio says that your numbers don't add up. What's your response, Mr. Trump? Well, I don't know if you're saying that. Look, I'm just saying very simply, we have a country that I've never seen anything like it. I've been going over budgets and looking at budgets. We don't bid things out. We don't bid out, as an example, uh, the drug industry, uh, pharmaceutical industry. They don't go out to bid. They just pay almost as if you're walking to a drugstore. That's what they're paying. And the reason is they have a fantastic lobby. They take care of all of the senators, the congressmen. They have great power, and they don't bid out. The military is never properly bid. When we go out to military bids, it's not properly bid. And the people that really sell us the product are oftentimes the product we don't want, only because that particular company has political juice, okay? I'm self-funding my campaign. Nobody's going to be taking care of me. I don't want anybody's money. I will tell you something. We're going to go out to bid in virtually every different facet of our government. We're going to save a fortune. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Trump. Senator Cruz, you advocate allowing younger workers to put some of their Social Security taxes into personal accounts. What do you say to critics who say that market volatility means that this is a disastrous proposal? Well, number one, we need to see responsibility. Social Security right now is careening towards insolvency, and it's irresponsible. And any politician that doesn't step forward and address it is not being a real leader. We need to see political courage to take this on and save and strengthen Social Security. And as president, what I will do for seniors, for anyone at or near retirement, there will be no changes whatsoever. Every benefit will be protected to the letter. But for younger workers, we need to gradually raise the retirement age. For younger workers, we need to change the rate of growth of benefits so it matches inflation instead of exceeding inflation. And as you noted, Dana, we need to have for younger workers that a portion of your tax payments are in personal accounts, like a 401k that you own, that you control, that you can pass on to your kids and grandkids. And one of the things that is critically important, listen, we've got lots of challenges in the world. But the answer can't just be wave a magic wand and say, problem, go away. You have to understand the problems. You have to have real solutions. It's like government spending. It is very easy. Hillary Clinton says she'll cut waste, fraud, and abuse. If only we had smarter people in Washington, that would fix the problem. You know what? That is the statement of a liberal who doesn't understand government is the problem. Here's my philosophy, the less government, the more freedom, the fewer bureaucrats, the more prosperity. And there are bureaucrats in Washington right now who are killing jo jobs. And I'll tell you, I know who they are. I will find them and I will fire them. Did you just compare Donald Trump to Hillary Clinton on this issue? I will let Donald speak for himself, but I will say there is a reason in my campaign, I've laid out a very, very specific spending cut plan, $500 billion. I've specified five major agencies that I would eliminate, 25 programs. And, and Dana, you know why political candidates don't do that? Because when you do that, the lobbyists attack you. When you specify the programs you would eliminate, then you get attacked. Let's take, for example, back in Iowa, the first primary. When I went to Iowa and campaigned against ethanol mandates, everyone said that was political suicide. You can't take on ethanol in Iowa. And my opponents on this stage not only didn't do the same, they attacked me and even promised to expand corporate welfare. If we're going to stop bankrupting our kids and grandkids, you've got to be willing to take on the lobbyists, which means not just some fanciful waste, fraud, and abuse, but specifying Thank these you. are the programs I will eliminate so that we can take care Thank of you, the Senator hardworking Cruz. taxpayers. Mr. Trump, would you like to respond? Yeah. Um, if you look back to Iowa, Ted did change his view and his stance on ethanol quite a bit. He did. And uh, at the end. Uh, not full on, but he did change his view in the hopes of maybe doing well. And uh, 
you know, I think everybody knows that. It was a front page story all over the place. And uh, he did make a change. Senator Cruz? Listen, if you're fed up with Washington, the question you ought to be asking is who's willing to take on Washington? It, it's easy to have language, I'm fed up with the corruption in Washington. But if you have a candidate who has been funding liberal Democrats and funding the Washington establishment, it's very hard to imagine how suddenly this candidate is going to take on Washington. When I stood up and led the fight against Obamacare, Washington was furious and attacked me, but I did it because I was honoring my commitment to the hardworking men and women of this country who are losing their jobs because of Obamacare. Okay. When I led the fight against amnesty, it's because I was standing with the people against Washington. And if you want to tell people you're going to stand against Washington, the question we should ask is when have you ever stood up to the lobbyist in Washington. Okay, Mr. Trump, I'll let you respond because he mentioned you, but then I'm going to move on to Governor Kasich. Go ahead. Well, that's fine. First of all, Ted was in favor of amnesty, so there's no question about that. And Sheriff, <laughs> Sheriff Joe Arpaio, so, and Sheriff Joe Arpaio recently endorsed me, and there's nobody tougher on the borders than Sheriff Joe. And Jeff Sessions, one of the most respected senators in Washington, an incredible man, also endorsed me. And there's nobody that knows more about the borders than Senator Jeff Sessions. Um, I would say this. We're all in this together. We're going to come up with solutions. We're going to find the answers to things. And so far, I cannot believe how civil it's been up here. Governor Kasich, let's get back to Social Security. You told a voter in New Hampshire to, quote, get over cuts to Social Security benefits because uh, you have a reform plan, and that is just the reality you say that, that is out there. Why is cutting Social Security payments the solution? Well, first of all, we hear about taking on Washington. I took on Washington and I won. I actually got the budget balance when I was a, a member of the Congress, the chairman of the Budget Committee. We paid down a half a trillion dollars of the national debt. Uh, we also uh, balanced the budget four years in a row, and we were just growing jobs uh, like crazy, and the, it, the wage uh, issue was not even an issue then. I also had a plan in 1999 to save Social Security and take the $5 trillion projected surplus and not only have Social Security for our young people, but also to give them private accounts. Now, there are more 18-year-olds who believe they have a better chance of seeing a UFO than a Social Security check. And we have a lot of seniors who are very nervous. I have a plan to fix it that doesn't even require re raising the retirement age. If you've had wealth throughout your lifetime, when the time comes for you to be on Social Security, you'll still get it. It will just simply be less. And for those people who depend on that Social Security, <laughs> they'll get their full benefit. That's the way it will work. And we don't have to monkey around with a retirement age. And how do I know that? I've done all this before. This is not a theory. Do you have to take on entitlement programs to balance a budget? Yes, but it doesn't mean you have to cut them. It means you need to innovate them the way we do things in the 21st century. So not only did we have a balanced budget in Washington, but when I went to Ohio, we were $8 billion in the hole, and now we're $2 billion in the black. Our credit is strong. We're up 400,000 jobs, and I want to go back with the same formula to beat the Washington insiders again. And I will get it done, and this country will be much stronger economically you, as a result. Thank you, Governor. Let's take a, a broader look at the Republican Party now. Mr. Trump, one of the concerns that your opponents have expressed throughout the course of this campaign is the notion that, in their estimation, you hold views that are at direct odds with Republican Party tradition. How are you looking to fundamentally change the Republican Party as its potential leader? What should the Republican Party stand for in 2016? Well, first of all, I don't really think that. I think that I hold views that are very similar to many of the people. Uh, we are more inclusive, and if you look at the polls, and if you look at the millions of people that have been pouring into the polls, it's, again, the biggest story. You look at all of these people that are coming in, something's happening. I am different in one primary respect, and that's trade. I feel that we have had horrible negotiators, horrible trade deals. The jobs in this country are disappearing, and especially the good jobs. You look at the recent jobs reports, which are really done so that presidents and politicians look good. Because all of these people are looking for jobs, when they give up, they go home, they give up, and they're considered statistically employed. So that's that. But I will say, trade deals are absolutely killing our country. The devaluations of their currencies by China and Japan and many, many other countries, and we don't do it because we don't play the game. And the only way we're going to be able to do it is we're going to have to do 
taxes unless they behave. If you don't tax certain products coming into this country from certain countries that are taking advantage of the United States and laughing at our stupidity, we're going to continue to lose businesses and we're going to continue to lose jobs. And if you look at the average worker over the last 12 years, their salary and their pay have gone down, not up. It's gone down. And I think that's why there's been such an outpouring of love to what I'm Thank saying. Thank you, Mr. Trump. Senator Cruz, Donald Trump has so far won 35 percent of the vote. Those people are signing up to his vision of the Republican Party. What do you think is wrong with that vision? Well, Donald is right, for example. He was just talking about international trade. He's right about the problems, but his solutions don't work. So, for example, his solution on international trade, he proposed earlier a 45 percent tariff on foreign goods. Now, he backed away from that immediately, and he may come back with a different number tonight. I don't know where he'll be tonight. But I'll tell you what happens. Yet, you know, we've seen prior presidential candidates who proposed massive tariffs. You know, Smoot Hawley led to the Great Depression. And the effect of a 45% tariff would be when you go to the store, when you go to Walmart, when you're shopping for your kids, the prices you pay go up 45%. But not only that, when you put those in place, because a tariff is a tax on you, the American people, but the response of that is that the countries we trade with put in their own tariffs, a much better solution that works is the tax plan I've laid out, which would enable our exports to be tax-free, would tax our imports, would not raise prices for Americans, and would not result in reciprocal tariffs. Thank you. Fix the problem, and, and, and that's what's missing you, from Senator. what Donald says. Mr. Trump will give you a chance yeah, to respond. The, the 45% the 45 tax is a threat. It was not a tax, it was a threat. It will be a tax if they don't behave. Uh, take China as an example. I have many friends, great manufacturers, they want to go into China. They can't. China won't let them. We talk about free trade. It's not free trade. It's stupid trade. China dumps everything that they have over here. No tax, no nothing, no problems, no, no curfews, no anything. We can't get into China. I have the best people, manufacturers, they can't get in. When they get in, they have to pay a tremendous tax. The 45 percent is a threat that if they don't behave, if they don't follow the rules and the regulations so that we can have it equal on both sides, we will tax you. It doesn't have to be 45, it could be less, but it has to be something because our country and our trade and our deals and our, most importantly, our jobs are going to hell. Senator Chris. Jake, let me be clear what Donald just said. He said that that 45% tax is a threat, and mind you, you are paying the tax. It's not China that pays the tax. It's you, the working men and women. So ask yourself at home, how is this helping you? If, if your wages have been stagnant for 20 years, if you can't pay the bills, how does it help you to have a president come and say, I'm going to jack, I'm going to put a 45% tax on diapers when you buy diapers, on automobiles when you buy automobiles, on clothing when you buy clothing. That hurts you. It, it's why we've got to get beyond rhetoric of China bad and actually get to how do you solve the problem because this solution would hurt jobs and hurt hardworking taxpayers in America. Okay. Jake, Mr. I have Trump. to say, honestly, it's just the opposite. What will happen if they don't behave we will put on a tax of some amount, and it could be a large amount, and we will start building those factories and those plants. Instead of in China, we'll build them here, and people will buy product from here rather than buying it through China, where we're being ripped off, and we have a $505 billion trade deficit right now. So we'll build our factories here, and we'll make our own products. And that's the way it should be done. And the way we've been doing it for the last long period of time is our country, our country is in serious, serious trouble. It's a bubble, and it's going to explode. Believe All right, me. we're going to take a very quick break. When we come back...